going to begin with a prayer, please. Father in heaven, we thank you for our daily bread. We thank you for our weekly Sabbath. We thank you for the promise of eternal life. Teach us to number our days that we may be counted worthy of your praise. And when the trumpet sounds and time shall be no more, do not catch us sleeping, but rather find us loving as if there is no tomorrow, forgiving as if there were no yesterdays, and worthy to dwell in your house forever. Amen. Well, I am going to just talk about Sabbath. Because <laughs> uh, I got a feeling you really need it. And uh, if you don't mind, I'll tell you how I met the Lord. Is that okay? It's my testimony. I'm in church. You got to listen. <clears throat> I grew up in a little place in Maryland. It was all dairy farms. And I was fortunate that I... The only two businesses in town were a general store and uh, a, a little church. And as a child, I went to that church, and I, I, I'm very fortunate that I did. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, it was all dairy farms around. And as uh, time went along, I was not a good student, and I did worse and worse, and my family sort of imploded. And by the time I was 16, I was living on my own, and um, God was not in the picture at all. When you're 16 and you're living on your own, uh, life is not easy. <laughs> and um, survival is, is really the thing. And I was very, very fortunate that I went to work for um, a surveying company and the, it was a father and son that ran it. And the son said, I will give you a, uh, a Jeep, well, a Bronco, and I will keep it full of gas, but you have to get some kind of equivalency degree. This was really great because if anyone here was alive in 1972 and remembers, there was a thing called the Arab oil embargo, and the company had their own gas tanks. <laughs> Uh, and so I enrolled in an industrial program, went to two classes, and managed to get uh, a, a equivalency degree um, third from the bottom of my class. <clears throat> You're thinking, if I need medical advice, I'm going to go somewhere else, right? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I, I became a carpenter and built houses and worked for some wonderful people and eventually had my own small contracting business. And I went to see about a job at uh, a house of people that were my favorite kind of customers. They had money. And, and uh, they, they went this giant bay window put in the house and we were discussing it. And uh, the, the father of the house was, a, they were Jewish, he was a periodontal surgeon and they had uh, four children, a son and three daughters. And when his 18-year-old daughter walked into the kitchen, that was the beginning of their worst nightmare because <laughs> that's my wife, Nancy. And, <laughs> and so <clears throat> uh, we got married, and I'm not allowed to say in public what her family thought or tried to do about that. Uh, I did once on a radio show. It got back to my wife, and she, um, never again. So, or I should say they didn't want me in the family. <clears throat> so, we got married, and, uh, and, and what am I going to do? I'm married into this family that wishes I didn't exist. <clears throat> Hint, if you marry into a Jewish family, and you are not born Jewish, there are only... One or two things I knew, know that you can do to get on your in-law's good side. And the number one is go to medical school. <laughs> there was a problem, however. No undergraduate school would take me. And I went and I talked to an uncle of mine who I really didn't know at all. I'd seen as a kid a couple times at family reunions, but we had the same last name, so he had to see me. And I remember sitting on his front porch, 
and talking to him. And he was a very wise person. And we talked for hours. And he said, first of all, you're, you're not stupid. And I had been raised being told I was stupid. And um, I, I, I can't and never have learned the multiplication tables. Uh, I have something called dyslexia, and it's pretty severe in some areas. And, um, but he said, there's ways around this. And he said, you're smart enough to be a doctor. And he said, I'm going to make a couple phone calls. We're going to have you made a resident of this state, and you'll be led into the undergraduate university. And he says, you have one semester, and the rest is up to you. I was terrified. I, I didn't know how to multiply, much less multiply fractions or anything, but God had invented something called the calculator. Yeah, which, uh, and, uh, and so I, I, I studied extraordinarily hard. I actually have 21 hours just in physics classes, all with A's. Um, and after two and a half years, I was accepted to multiple medical schools without an undergraduate degree. <laughs> <laughs> Who's bad now? Okay. <laughs> Which shows you what you can do if you marry my wife, Nancy. Okay. <laughs> and and so uh, I, you know, I went to medical school. I went to George Washington University for medical school, and um, we had our first child, a son, at the end of med school. And then I went to residency in the Pittsburgh area and uh, had uh, our second child in residency. And my wife and I uh, did not believe in God. Uh, we believed in the American dream. You are probably surrounded by people who believe in the American dream. And the American dream is um, live in the best place that you can, send your kids to the best school that you can, go on the best vacations that you can, and approach all of life as if you're going to get out of life alive. Yeah. Uh, and so that's the way we lived. Um, did we have some religious celebrations? Yes. My wife, grown up a Jew, I you know, had a little dash of Christianity in me. Um, and so my kids were raised thinking that at Christmas time, the fiddler on the roof slid down the chimney. <laughs> If, if he saw his shadow, they got Hanukkah guilt over under the Christmas tree. Anyways, <clears throat> you probably live with some neighbors like this, right? And, uh, and, and that and life went along fine. Uh, we, we, out of residency, uh, ended up on the coast of Maine, uh, where, where we lived for about 13 years, I think. And so life went along, and we had all these things that the American dream says will satisfy you. And I had great work. I was an ER doc and eventually director of the emergency department and everything. And, uh, and everything looked perfect, except for when things started going bad. And the first thing that went wrong was that on vacation, I wasn't with them, but my, my wife and children were there, uh, with her family, and her brother drowned in front of her and my children. Yeah. Uh, and it really changed uh, the way, uh, particularly my older son saw life, and my wife got very depressed. Uh, and my wife stayed that way, and she didn't get treated, and life became harder and harder. And, and so... Um, one after another, bad things started happening. I'll just tell you a couple that I will mention in public, and a lot of them aren't even worth mentioning, and a lot of them I don't want to even remember. But uh, one of the things that happened was I had a patient that became obsessed with me, and he uh, started stalking me. And, over, and I'd seen him a number of times over the years and resuscitated him and resuscitated him from overdoses. And... He got more and more obsessed, and he named his grunge rock band after me and sent a picture of them all playing in their birthday suits to me. <clears throat> and, and then he did scarier and scarier things. And finally, um, uh, the, the police went and, and checked on him, 
and, and found his mother in the closet where she had been for a week, taped up and beaten to death uh, with carpet freshener sprinkled over her. Uh, and that didn't help my wife's mood at all. And, and then sort of the last thing that, that really I remember was on this beautiful fall day, I got home from working the night shift and I'm just lazing around kind of catnapping on, on the sofa and it was a perfect sky, uh, just a perfect, this is what you go to New England for kind of day and all of you who are alive that are old enough remember what the sky looked like in New England because you remember what it looked like in New York because it was September 11th. And my wife came home uh, from the post office, which you could walk to. We lived in this little village right, right on the harbor in South Freeport. And, and, uh, and she said, something really terrible is happening in New York. And we turned on a television and we tuned in as this horrible, horrible thing happened. And uh, then we got a phone call. It was shortly after the second tower went down. And the phone call was from my, uh, my neighbor and uh, she had a son that was my son's age. They'd grown up together. They're back and forth in, each, in our house and her house. And she said, I need your help. I have to get Jamie from school. His dad was in the first plane. <clears throat> Later that afternoon, got a call from a childhood friend of my wife. Uh, her husband and her brother were in the Pentagon. And uh, her brother was uh, killed her husband was not. She had just had a baby a couple of days before, um, but her husband couldn't come home even though they lived you know, less than 10 miles away. He was taken and put on a, a, a nuke sub to command it. And so I actually ended up going down uh, to be with that family a little. And what happened during all of this is that I woke up to the fact that there's evil on the planet. Now my worldview was scientific. If you can't reproduce it, measure it, I don't want to talk about your make-believe God, okay? But evil is a spiritual concept. Evil is not something you can measure. And, and Lord knows literally, you don't want to reproduce it. And so I began to think about that. And my, my life personally was horrible at that time. Um, I, I wanted to be divorced from my wife more than anything. Uh, I couldn't stand being at home. She just wouldn't get treated for this. And just the weight of the world seemed uh, to be on me. And, and then, you know, you wake up to the fact that there's evil on the planet. How had that one gone over me being an ER doctor, you know? And yet, I woke up to the fact that there's evil. And then I started thinking about it. if there's evil, there's got to be good. Okay, where does the good come from? And I particularly would remember those moments if I was running a trauma code. And, and if you come into the hospital and you've been struck by a vehicle or something and you don't have your wallet with you, um, you don't have a name. You might be unconscious. And those people are all given names so the computer systems can start working and you can start getting labs and x-rays and everything. And so they become John Doe or Jane Doe or Baby Doe. And you just think about, I'd sometimes step back and look at all these people working to save John or Jane or Baby Doe's life. And we didn't even know their name. And they're pouring everything they have in to saving a human being that they will never see again, and they don't know their name or vice versa. Is that not good? Yeah. Do you think that the Lord isn't there when that's happening? Okay, so there's evil and there's good. I'm going to go on a search for where does the good come from. And I start reading books. <clears throat> I read the Ramayana. I read the Bhagavad Gita. I read the Koran. I read a bunch of books like this. <clears throat> And there are some wonderful things in them. And there are some truths. But there is not an answer to what do you do about evil in the world. And then, uh, and life for me is just getting harder and tougher and tougher. And you do all the stuff that everybody does to try to escape. And one Sunday morning in the hospital, and I was in a little hospital then, uh, 
By the way, write this down. If you're going to have a heart attack, do it on Sunday morning between the hours about 6 to 10. <laughs> and I, 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 I didn't have something to read, and I'm addicted to reading. And I went looking uh, for something because the patients I had didn't need anything at that moment. And on a coffee table with a bunch of old National Geographics and that type of thing, I, I saw an orange book, and I picked it up, and I remember looking at the spine, and it said Holy Bible on it. And I thought, you know, I haven't read this one. <clears throat> and there's no way I can finish this before the next patient needs something. And we don't have one at home. And we had a library at home. My wife's an English professor by training. Um, and so I stole it. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. I've been forgiven. Okay. Um, now, here comes what is called prevenient grace. Where do you start reading in this book? You start at the front. You start at the back. Well, here's the prevenient grace. My name is Matthew. If my parents had named me Numbers or Jeremiah, <laughs> we wouldn't be here, okay? And, and I started reading in Matthew, and, and I realized that this Jesus Christ was the Lord of the universe. Yeah. And I think it was in context to all those other texts that I had read that Christ was so real. At one moment, he was more human than any human I had ever met. And yet, I recognized on the other side, he was God, Lord of the universe. That's what Christ is. Uh, and so, we had a lot of things going on um, but eventually I came to my wife and I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to pursue this God. I'm going to figure out what he wants me to do because I am positive that he has the answers to evil, pollution, crime, addiction, you name it. It's all here. And oh, by the way, I'm going to quit my job we're going to sell our house, which we did, and we moved into a house exactly the size of our garage. You ever seen a doctor's garage? Um, <laughs> and and I'm going to I'm going to and and I'm going to try to figure out what Jesus would have me do. And even though I was trying to get rid of her, she said, "Okay." And, um, and so we moved, and we gave away about half of our stuff or whatever, and, we, and I gave away my job, and I gave away my title, and I gave away my identity, and I got so much. And the first thing I got was my son um, asked to read that book too, and I gave it to him, and he believed. He had a vision very shortly after that, of him carrying a, my medical bag. I never used it because I wasn't a family doc. But carrying that bag and a bunch of little children around him. That was almost 20 years ago. Today, he's the uh, head of the pediatrics departments at Tinwick Hospital in Kenya. <clears throat> yeah. He's literally moved the, the needle on infant mortality for three million people. Yeah. Um, and, and the next person uh, that something happened to in my family was my wife. As my son says, mom does not have a mystical bone in her body, and she's the one who was walking down a mountain, and Jesus came beside her and said, I'll never leave you. <clears throat> And the last was my daughter, who was at some camp thing, uh, and uh, 
those who teach teenagers in the church remember this hint. They had a big bonfire at the end. You were supposed to write something on it that you wanted to give up to God. And she wrote, my life. So we are, um, um, we're, we're all on the same page here. By the way, I, if, I don't want to forget to do this. God gave me a new wife. I'm just married to the same woman. But, but my new wife is smoking hot, Proverbs. <laughs> Proverbs 31 wife, okay? She literally is the Proverbs 31 wife. And so our family is on a, on a new page, and, and I have four grandchildren now. And... Um, my daughter is married to a pastor, and she works for a, a ministry called Heart of Africa. My son, I told you, is in Kenya. Don't think small hospital when you hear missions hospital. Their hospital has on the front, we treat Jesus heals. And he now has like an 80-bed NICU. Um, and, so, uh, and, and so our family is all in the same place. But one of the first things that we began to do was keep the Sabbath. And that's what I want to lean into here. And that's what you said, I'm just going to give them a little, I'm going to give them a lot, okay? <laughs> this is the all-you-can-eat buffet of Sabbath here. And uh, why, one of the reasons was because my family had a two- or three-year period where we're on different pages as far as our faith and our beliefs. And, and, but Sabbath was familiar territory to my wife. And so she would, she would go along with this routine. And so we started just shutting it down one day out of the week. And that, that day, I believe, ideally should be Sunday. If you need to do it another day, great. If you need to shift it around, great. I understand people have jobs like emergency medicine nurses and EMTs and uh, police officers and that sort of thing. So sometimes you have to shift it around. That's the least ideal. Sometimes you get to have it the same day every week, but not on Sunday. But I think God wants us to be together for this day of rest. And so um, I want to talk just a little bit about the Sabbath. Uh, the Sabbath commandment is the longest commandment in Scripture. It is the only commandment that God applies to God. God rests. God is holy. Therefore, rest is holy. We do not believe live in a society where people believe that rest is holy. They believe that busyness is holy. They believe that having a full calendar means importance. And, uh, and yet, we've, we see in Scripture, God is holy, God rests, therefore rest is holy. We see that on the seventh day of creation. And Sabbath is woven into creation whether you observe it or not. It's there. And the Ten Commandments are the, one of the greatest gifts that God has ever given yes. humanity. Yes. And I'm going to explain them for a moment. If you grew up, by the way, in a Lutheran church or a Catholic church, you number the commandments differently. I'm going with the original numbering that the Jews had. They owned the real estate first. The Bible says don't make, move the real estate marker. So I'm going to go with that. Okay. Commandments one through three, I'm the Lord your God, you're not to have any gods above me, I made you, you can't make me, idols are out, uh, and, and do not take my name in vain. Those commandments are about how we understand God, are they not? And so they really come first in the order of the commandments. Um, Commandments five through, t oh, so I'm going to put those commandments over here. One through three, you guys get to be the God side, all right? Commandments five through ten uh, are commandments about humanity. Honor your parents. Don't kill, lie, cheat, steal, run around, or put stuff on your credit card to keep up with your neighbors. <laughs> I paraphrase. Thou shall not put stuff on your credit card. Okay? Those are commandments 5 through 10. Those aren't about God. They're about people. So commandments 1 through 10 over here, those are about God. You guys got the commandments about people. This is about heaven. This is about earth. This side is about eternity. This side is about temporal things. The longest commandment 
the commandment to remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the Sabbath is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You, your kids, your manservant or your maidservant. Oh, I wish I had a couple of those. The foreigners, the sojourners in your land are not to work. Even your cattle are supposed to come to a rest. To which group does it belong? Heaven, earth, God, humanity, forever, temporal. Got any thoughts? Both, yes. I view it as a bridge between heaven and earth. And when I walk out on that bridge once a week, God never stands me up. We stand God up. And, and I have to tell you this, so nobody gets it wrong. Here's my bottom, bottom line on the theology of Sabbath. Sabbath keeping is not a condition of getting into heaven. It's just the condition that heaven is in when you get there. And in Genesis, we mess up. Our great-grandparents, Adam and Eve, did the one thing they weren't supposed to do. And because of that, the doors to paradise are guarded and we're not allowed back in that way. But I got to give you a hint. Psst, the side door is open on their Sabbath. And, uh, and, and I think right now the world is just hungry for rest. They're hungry for the rest for your soul. And if, I, if I'm working, by the way, I lost control of a church once doing this. I had everybody buddy up, or I have people do this, and share your memories of Sabbath when you're growing up. And young people don't have memories of that. So they got to go, there's all of a sudden a premium on, on folks with white hair or no hair. And I've done this many times. I've been keeping the Sabbath for 20 years. I've been writing about it for 12 or so. Uh, and I know what people are going to say. They're going to say, generally, I went to church on Sunday. And I had big meals with my family. Raise your hand if that's, those are true for you. Okay. Big meals with families. Uh, took a nap. Raise your hand. Made to take a nap? Yeah, keep them up, okay. Uh, that's the day that mom and dad were both home. Uh, that's the day that even if we were on a farm, only what had to be done was done. And that's the way that Western civilization has worked for almost 2,000 years. Every generation of the church has said, gee, that's an Old Testament law. Do we have to keep it? In every generation, whether it's the Orthodox and the Catholic Church separating or the Reformation or all the thousands of branches that have come off the Christian tree, um, virtually every single one of them has said, mm, Old Testament, but really good for us. Why? Well, because those memories that you have, and maybe I just called to mind, and by the way, it says remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Just the re mere bringing to mind the rest that comes from God is a holy thing. Not just observing, but remember the Sabbath. And, and the, the reason why is because the memories that people have and the Ten Commandments are connected. I went to church you'll have no other gods above you. I went to church, the idols get put aside. The opposite of taking the Lord's name in vain is what? Singing, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. We might read scripture to ourselves every day of the week, but scripture is always read out loud here, correct? Um, we might pray uh, we might even pray with our spouse, but this is the place for corporate prayer. We, and, and so what we're doing is we're, fought, we're just walking down the Ten Commandments with the memories of it. Big meal with family. There is nothing that honors me more than having my family around the dinner table. Yeah. And when my kids from Kenya get here, 
and my grandkids are all together. Oh, how beautiful. Okay, how about thou shall not kill, Dr. Sleeth, Mr. Smarty Pants? How does that work? Physically impossible to do while you're taking a nap. <laughs> All right, you say, I've got you. How about thou shalt not commit adultery? All right, we don't have too many little ones here, but I'll keep this <clears throat> just between us adults. Some of you will remember getting up from that nap that your parents made you take every Sunday and getting up early and going to your parents' bedroom door. It was locked. <laughs> they were not committing adultery. <laughs> Harder to envy and put stuff on your credit cards if the stores are closed. You, you, can, do, you can walk this whole thing out. This, the Ten Commandments aren't magic. And, and, and neither, neither is the Sabbath. But wow, you put it all together and things get a lot easier. And, and, uh, and so one of the things I want to take you to is, is the Sabbath in New Testament and beyond. Jesus observed the Sabbath his entire life on earth. And, and he said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. And he's constantly teaching about the Sabbath. And when he gives his first sermon at his hometown synagogue, Luke 4, where he reads from Isaiah and says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He basically says, I'm here to set you free, to set you free. And oh, it's the Jubilee year. Um, and that is the mother of all Sabbaths. And that's the year that all slaves were set free. You're set free, you're set free, you're set free. And and, and so, in Jesus' um, ministry, he does the majority of his miracles on the Sabbath day. This is not an accident. Nothing in this happens by accident. Um, and on the Sabbath, spread over four Gospels, he does seven miracles. This is not accident. Um, and all of those miracles are of one kind. He doesn't walk on water on that day. He doesn't feed 5,000. He heals. He heals, he heals, he heals. And you and I need healing from the busyness of the world. I want you to think about who has a vested interest in taking all those things away. Church, family, time for moms and dads to not commit adultery. All those things, who's against them? Say it. Satan, you have an enemy. There's only one person in the Bible who introduces themselves to God as busy. And it's in the book of Job. And Satan is late for the meeting. And God says, where have you been, Satan? And Satan says, I'm busy. I'm going to and fro, up and down on the earth. Satan wants you to be conformed to his image. Busy. And Christ wants you to be conformed to his image. A man of peace. A guy that can sleep in a boat in a storm. And, and so... Um, you don't have to keep Sabbath. And virtually no Christians do this these days. But I can promise you from 20 years with it that you will get more done. You will find rest for your souls. And, and you will grow in a way that I cannot describe to you other than to say you got to try it. And so I, 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 I bragged in the first service. I'm going to brag in the second because... My children came into, into faith um, at a very crucial time. They're 15 and 13, I think, at, at that time. And, and they're at a school called St. Johnsbury Academy. You can look it up. It's a very rigorous high school. We had our kids tuitioned in by our town. We couldn't have afforded to send uh, kids in at that time. 
um, but our town tuition them in. And that school has graduated 50 congressmen, senators, and one president. And my son had full scholarships to Rensselaer and Princeton and everything when he, he's coming out of this. But let me tell you, he was told you're not going to be successful if you don't work on Sunday. His teachers told him and they told my wife because she was teaching there at the time that you're just not going to be competitive. Well, I've already given part of it away. Where do you think he graduated in his high school class? Number one. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, and my daughter, um, when he went off to college, and by the way, we had somebody say, you know, you ought to send your kid to a Christian college. And I remember my wife and I say, what's a Christian college? <laughs> Anyways, he went to Asbury. <laughs> Turns out it's a pretty good place to go. Um, he went to Asbury. His little sister misses him so much, and she pleads and pleads, and she wants to quit school and go be a missionary in South America. Or all this kind of, no one will take her. She's like a 14, 15-year-old kid. And, and so, literally, she tried. She applied. Nobody, no ministry is going to take her. And so she pleaded with the admissions counselor who would stay at our house when uh, she came up to New England to recruit, um, can, I, can I go to Asbury early? And the admissions counselor said, if you do really, really well on your SATs, maybe they will take you. She missed two questions. She disputes one. Um, and, and where do you think they both graduated in their classes from Asbury? My son is the youngest graduate from University of Kentucky ever. Where do you think he graduated in his class? He's boarded in both internal medicine and pediatrics, and he will not anymore share what his scores are, but we have an idea what it is, <laughs> okay? He makes $2.50 an hour now. He's banking in the heavenly system. Uh, God's system is completely different than Earth's, okay? And I would plead with you to try the Sabbath because you need rest for your souls. And, and, and I want to give you the, the bottom, bottom line on Sabbath. Jesus, in the, I think it was read here, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, upon you, and learn of me. I'm humble and meek, and you'll find rest for your souls. And, and so you can't get to the rest that God wants to give you until you learn how to be humble and meek. And that's almost impossible today. Because everything is about how famous you are, how many people like you, whether or not you're an influencer. We even do this in the church. And uh, we, we kind of bow down to famous people and that sort of thing. The saints in the church are always in the back washing the dishes, I'll tell you. I've been in the church for 20 years. They're not the famous people. And so at this intersection of humble and meek, we find rest. And, and Jesus gives us further advice. You know, you can find anything in the universe based upon an X, a Y, and a Z axis. And time. You can... Did I say something wrong? <laughs> Get me back on track. I just got to tell a story. I just got to tell. X, Y, Z is time. Oh, thank you. Get me back there. Bunny trail. I am in a, in a, in a church setting, and I'm preaching to, it's all men, and I'm preaching about... Uh, uh, Paul and Philip, is Paul, yeah, is it Paul and Philip? No. Paul in the, in the Philippian jail. Silas. Silas. Silas, thank you. Oh, this is a nice church. Paul, <laughs> Paul and Silas, you know, and they, preach, and they preach up this earthquake and everything, and the jailer says, I'm going to kill myself, and all anybody's got to do in the jail is stay quiet, and they're home free. And I leaned to these guys and I said, what would you do? Would you stay quiet or what? And these guys in 
little Sandy, maximum security prison, took this question very seriously, <laughs> okay? But when Jesus is in the house, everybody lives. Right as I'm preaching about this, a guard comes in and we go on lockdown. I got to stay there for three hours in a lockdown area. <laughs> I did get a chance to call my wife, and I don't know whether God was grinning or done at me slapping me, but I knew the Lord was there, okay? Back on track, X, Y, Z. Um, <laughs> and so if you have X, Y, and Z, and then you have time, you can, in, in the whole universe, you can grid it, and you can know when our planet comes around, where on the planet. You can find things utterly precisely. Here are the four coordinates for the peace that everybody's looking for. Humble and meek, spirit, Holy Spirit, and truth. There is no correct time. There is no convenient time. The time to get this is right now. And, and, uh, and so this, this is hard. The whole world wants to take it away from you. Some churches want to take it away from you. Uh, I, I went to a Christian college recently, and, and, I, and I was doing the chapel on Tuesday and Wednesday. And on Tuesday, uh, I said, everybody's dismissed when they're supposed to be. And I said, but anybody who wants to stay can stay. About 200 students stayed for three hours. This young generation, all they want to hear is truth. Where do they get it? And they stayed for three hours. And I met with a group that afternoon. And I met with a group that evening. And then the next morning, I was to do chapel. And, and the chaplain said, the faculty is very upset with you. Those students belong to the faculty. You can, you, can, you can have them stay, but I'm going to dismiss them and make them leave for 15 minutes. That's at a Christian college. That's as good as it gets. At the Asbury Revival, there were professors that said, I don't care if there's a revival here. Your homework is due. Okay? There's always somebody, and, and often they're from the church, and often they have a really good plan for your life, but it's not the plan of peace. It's not the prince of peace, it's plan for your life. And so, um, what you've got to get your head around is that God's rest is more powerful than your work. And if you haven't gotten your head around that, I'm going to ask you to, uh, if, if that's a peace that you desire, you cannot sing your way into it, you cannot pray your way into it, you've got to meet You've got to meet God at humble and meek, Holy Spirit, and truth. You've got to say, I don't have this. And, and I will stop, and if you want to come up here and get it, if you want to sit in your seat, if you want to go home and find it, but please find that intersection, humble and meek, Spirit and truth. I promise you, you'll find the Lord of the galaxy, the universe, the maker of life, the prince of peace, Emmanuel, God with us, the branch. <laughs> uh, you'll find all of that at that intersection in a way that you've been longing for, I promise, but you haven't found. Let me pray over you. By the way, what happened here Friday when I prayed for people or with them? Raise your hand if you were in those lines. That was the Holy Spirit, right? Dr. Sleeve doesn't do that. Holy Spirit does that. And, the, and, and Jesus, when he, when he was working through me on Friday, I've never experienced anything like that. I'm still weirded out by it. I'm particularly weirded out that I anointed 400 people, dropped the oil, and it's still got the same amount in it. Yeah, weird too. But... Things in the Bible are logical. They, they, they move the same. And Jesus only ever healed one person at a time. And I don't have the strength to, for Jesus to use me like that. Thank goodness you stopped. I was about ready to drop. Um, I understand somebody touched my robe now. I get it. Jesus, that part of the Godhead, heals us one at a time. The Holy Spirit can heal at mass. And that's why I wanted Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. And if there's anybody left from the praise team, if there's just one person that can play that, I would really like it. And let me, let me um, pray for you. You gonna do it? 
You are the man. Jesus, Prince of Peace. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Come flood our hearts. Fill the atmosphere with peace that passes our human understanding that you promise us forever and ever, that peace that you gave us by a violent death on the cross. Life is in the blood, oxygen is in the blood, and peace is offered by Christ. It's delivered in mass by the Holy Spirit. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you flood this place with a peace that we don't really understand but we long for. And I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, my Savior.